Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to talk about conductor DMC and what conductor DMC really is, is a direct consequence of Faraday's law of magnetic induction, which states that whenever there is a conductor inside a time-changing magnetic field, there's going to be a current induced in that conductor. And in electronic products, we always have magnetic fields. So there's always going to be a current induced into any conductor. And this results in noise. As you remember, noise is a signal that you don't want as opposite to signal that you want. And today we're going to talk about five most common mistakes that I see engineers do when they're trying to deal with this noise. So the first mistake, which is really, really common, is not having sufficient amount of filters. But what do I mean by that? Noise can be categorized into two types, differential mode noise and common mode noise. The difference between them is that in a differential mode noise, the noise is traveling in opposite direction, meaning that if it's a power supply, it will flow in a positive polarity on VCC line and it will flow with a negative polarity in the ground. Opposite to that, in a common mode scenario, the noise will flow on both lines in the same direction. So the filtering that you would typically need to provide within your circuit is going to be either common mode filtering or differential mode filtering. And you really do need to have both of them. Most common example would be applying an EMI filter on AC main supply. And an EMI filter will have methods of dealing with both types of noise integrated within the same component. You can usually either purchase an EMI filter off the shelf or you can design your own by using, for example, WebEx tool or just a set of calculations. While buying an EMI filter off the shelf typically gives you better performance because it's very compact and all the parts are tightly matched to one another, designing it yourself offers much cheaper way of doing this. And it is a lot more satisfying. The other thing we tend to use frequently is capacitors and ferrite beads and we use ferrite beads to have each on a power supply pin to each IC and we use capacitors to filter out noise between power supply and ground. So both are examples in this situation of dealing with differential mode noise. However, you can sometimes also see common mode noise filters on power supplies and uh, interconnects and those would be common mode chokes. So what I tend to do is I install a ferrite bead, like I said, on every power supply pin of the IC. I do not install ferrite beads on ground because that creates voltage drops and this can induce more noise in fact. So this is kind of counterintuitive. So you always want to install ferrite beads on power supplies, but never on ground. Secondly, I tend to have common mode noise chokes on external DC inputs as well as interconnects such as USB cables. Obviously, those need to be rated accordingly. You don't want the big power supply common mode choke on a USB cable, right? The second point of today's video is actually quite related, and that is not having isolation between different electronic products and circuits. It is actually extremely common in audio electronics world because you will have many different products connected to the same ground. And what this also means is that the shields are going to be connected to each other and this creates a massive spider web where the noise starts traveling in all directions and that creates ground loops. Most commonly, this results in audible buzzing from your loudspeakers, but not always and sometimes it can be quite high frequency such as in example with USB frame rate. So what is the best way of dealing with ground loops? Isolation. And that applies to all kinds of cables. That applies to coaxial cables, USB cables, 
as well as Ethernet cables and so on and so on. Whenever you have an output from your electronic system that goes to a black box which could be located hundreds of meters away if you just don't know where it's going, uh, for example in case of uh, RJ485 it could be a zero interface and it can go to a server room, wherever. Consider adding isolation to it because if it goes to that server room it's going to pick up all kinds of noise that is going to come and ruin the performance of your system. So this problem is most apparent when electronic products are connected with long wires but that does not mean that it doesn't happen when for example you have a USB cable connecting two devices. USB isolation is typically quite expensive so it's only performed in rare circumstances and uh, tends to be reserved for hi-fi audio equipment only. Still, it is the best way of dealing with the issue. On a related topic, when applying isolation between different parts of a circuit, you must make sure that there is a gap between them. And what I mean by that is that you must envision being able to cut this gap with scissors and completely disconnecting one circuit from another circuit when both of them will continue functioning as normal. If this isn't the case and you have nets connecting isolated piece of the circuit to not isolated piece of the circuit, then you might as well not have any isolation at all because you will have either differential mode noise or common mode noise traveling between these parts because this is what noise does. It's a very very common mistake for engineers to think that they can isolate one pin from another pin uh, by connecting them to different polygon pores and this is how they begin to split ground planes under the IC. In reality it never really works like that because planes start coupling into one another capacitively and the noise continues flowing. Whereas in the meantime you significantly reducing the impedance of ground connection and introducing voltage drops which creates radiated noise. So there is no other isolation than galvanic isolation which is provided by transformers, galvanic isolating ICs, optocouplers and devices like that that have a specified isolation to a certain voltage level. Everything else just simply doesn't work. And this is the main point I'm trying to make here. Moving on, the third most common mistake we're going to cover today is not considering the effects of inrush current. And the inrush current is happening when you boot up your system and it starts drawing current to all the different parts of it at the same time. The voltage flicker test that is specified by EN61000-3-3 is one of the oldest EMC tests there is and it refers exactly to what it sounds like it refers to and that is the flickering of lightning. When multiple bulbs are connected in electronic circuit and they start drawing current, eventually if they exceed the available supply they will start to flicker. And this effect is what made people introduce the EMC requirement to control flickering lights back in 1890. Imagine that. Of course, it not used to be called EMC back then, but even still we use flickering of lights as a measurement of inrush current in electronic systems. The usual way of reducing inrush current is adding resistance. But you may not want to do that in your power supply because such resistor is going to dissipate a lot of heat. However, there is such magical component that is called thermistor. And what thermistor does, it has a certain resistance at a certain temperature. And thermistors come in two flavors, PTC thermistors and NTC thermistors. The difference between them is that in NTC thermistor, as the temperature increases, the resistance is going down. Whereas in a PTC thermistor, as the temperature increases, the resistance also increases. So to block inrush current, we would use NTC thermistors, whereas PTC thermistors are typically used as fuses 
and you would commonly see them in a market labeled as PTC fuse. PTC fuses are self-resettable, meaning that once it cools down, it will allow current to pass again. So obviously, NTC thermistor needs to be added into your switch mode power supply, whereas if you didn't design it yourself, it might be quite difficult to do so. But what can you do as a circuit designer if you don't design your power supply? The other thing that you can do to reduce inrush current is to start your uh, components sequentially rather than at the same time. And this is why we employ power management integrated circuits that allow resets to travel from um, one place to another. Therefore, you start different parts of the system at different time intervals. And uh, as one part of the system is starting another part of the system, there is no inrush current in the system. The, this is becoming a continuous draw of current opposite to everything just starting up at the same time and blowing up your fuse. The fourth most common mistake is quite related to inrush current and that is voltage surges or not considering voltage surges in this case. Voltage surges happen naturally with long wires that accumulate a lot of charge as I described previously when they encounter potential difference between different parts of the system and this is something that tends to be quite present in electric grid and your device needs to be able to cope with it as well as not to create unnecessary voltage dips and interruptions itself. Depending on the environment where your product is going to be applied, you will have different sets of standards. However, most common standards that do apply in all environments are EN61 000-3-2, which is specifying limits for harmonic fluctuations, then EN61 000-3-3, which uh, is specifying limits for inrush current as well as voltage uh, surges, and you would also have EN61 000-3-11, which is specifying limits for voltage dips. So I think the above is pretty self-explanatory, where it simply means that sometimes you will have a voltage potential slightly bigger or smaller than the nominal voltage of your electric supply and your system needs to be capable of dealing with that. Likewise, there will be some sort of harmonic uh, variations or fluctuations in this grid and your system needs to be able to continue functioning and do not create harmonics itself. So the usual way of dealing with this problem is having voltage clumps in the power supply. And uh, this is achieved with another ISTOR. This time it's called a varistor. And a varistor is simply a resistor which resistance is changing depending on the voltage. So below its clamping voltage, its resistance is going to be quite low and it will be invisible from the circuit, whereas above it, it will start conducting current and therefore clamping the supply. While varistors tend to be quite effective when dealing with short fluctuations in the supply, they tend to be slightly less effective when dealing with long surges and that is because they just start blowing up. So you might want to have something more than just a varistor in your power supply circuit. And this something more is a crowbar electronic circuit. And a crowbar voltage protection circuit is the type of circuit that creates a short circuit from the power supply to ground until the over voltage condition goes away. There are different ways of designing crowbar circuits but you typically want to make sure that you have one if your power supply is connected to mains grid. Looking at this problem the other way, if we want to prevent harmonics from going back into the mains, we first need to look at the source of these harmonics and they typically happen during rectification of uh, AC. So if you're having this kind of a problem and you have a variable frequency drive that is chopping the uh, AC into DC and is doing that 
at a very high speed and with very fast switching current, then you will have a lot of harmonics going back into the supply. So how do you actually reduce that? This can be actually quite problematic, especially for industrial equipment that, like I said, contains a lot of such circuitry. Aside of the usual ways of dealing with this problem, which is introducing industrial EMI filters with lots of capacitors, another way of dealing with this problem that I can think of is adding power factor correction to your AC input, which basically means adding an AC-DC boost converter in front of your chopping rectifier. Then your chopping rectifier is going to rectify DC rather than AC and therefore the amount of induced harmonics back into the supply is going to be massively reduced. PFC circuits also make input current in phase with instantaneous line voltage therefore reducing the overall power consumed. However, they are obviously added cost and another circuit block you need to think of. But if you simply cannot pass the harmonics emission standard without adding it, then obviously this is what you just have to do. And a good design practice is to leave space for it because you can buy EMI filters and PFC converters as separate module blocks that you can simply add into your system there and then. So if you allow space and design for it, then you can obviously add it after you've done some EMC testing to check whether you comply with emission standards or not. Whereas if you didn't leave space for it, your job will be much more difficult. Finally, the last point I want to talk today about is ESD. So the most common mistake number five is going to be not adding TVS protection diodes to your inputs and outputs. Strictly speaking, ESD may or may not be considered as conducted emission, but it is conducting. It's conducting charge from our bodies to electronic equipment. So this is why I decided to put it here. And it is also related to the concept of voltage clamping because you first of all want to clamp the voltage spike that you get from external source and secondly you want to direct it into a safe area such as metalwork or shield. So the way to accomplish it is obviously adding TVS protection diodes and what TVS protection diodes R is very similar to what we just talked about when we talked about varistors. They have a specific voltage clamping level below which they conduct current as normal and have minimal effects on the circuit they're protecting, other than some added capacitance of course, and beyond the voltage clamping point they start conducting current and actually clamping the voltage spike. Since the voltage spike is only going to last less than a millisecond, they tend to handle very large spikes quite effectively. But in order for a TVS diode to do its job properly, you must also place it in a way where it can do so. And by this I mean placing it directly on the line that it protects. Very often I see engineers place TVS diodes on the opposite layer or have a, some sort of a spur net going to a TVS diode where the main net is going into a completely opposite direction. Obviously this isn't gonna be very effective when it comes to limiting a voltage spike. So you want to apply your TVS diodes on the net and you want to make it as easy as possible to clamp the voltage level. Secondly, like I said earlier, you want to direct this voltage spike into a safe area and the safe area would be a metalwork if you have one. So in that case, you would connect the grounding side of the TVS diode to metalwork rather than to circuit ground. So you would want to have some sort of an outer ring around your IO connections where you would connect your TVS diodes and shields. Beware that having shield connections in the middle of circuit board is typically not very effective because you're going to have long traces connecting those shield nets and I try to avoid that and this because this creates 
high impedance of um, this connection. If you really want to direct this current, you can only do that by having low impedance, otherwise it's going to flow in a different path that you haven't thought of. So when you have a connector in the middle of a PCB uh, with no immediate connection to the chassis, I would rather connect it to circuit ground than have a long trace connecting the shield of that connector to the outer ring. And as you might guess from this discussion, the impedance of metal work connection is very, very important. So you must have uninterrupted long white traces connecting your shields if you want them to be effective in dealing with ESD spikes. You can lower down the impedance of the metalwork connection even further by adding capacitors between metalwork and circuit ground, but they must be rated at very high voltage potential such as 1.5 kilovolt. This technique typically tends to reduce radiated emissions as well because it works both ways. It reduces the impedance of a metalwork and it reduces the impedance of your circuit ground. And one you want for having a high effect when dealing with ESD currents and the other you want when dealing with radiated emissions. I hope it makes sense and this is the end of this video. So let's quickly summarize what we covered today because it was quite a long one. So when dealing with conducted sources of emissions and immunity problems, you really want to think about five things. And those are first filters. Do you have enough filters? Do you have filters for differential mode noise? Do you have filters for common mode noise? Secondly, isolation. When you have a connection to an external black box, do you really know what it's going to be like? And if you do not, should you consider isolating your circuitry from that black box? The third point is consider the inrush current of your system. What it's going to be like? Can you simulate it? If you have multiple devices starting up at the same time, can you think of a way to start them sequentially and have some sort of power management control over them? The fourth point was about voltage surges and you need to think about whether your circuit has means of dealing with them. Does it have some sort of a circuitry that would uh, create a short circuit condition in case of a long applied surge or is it just going to blow up in flames? The item number five was about electrostatic discharge and whether or not you have means of dealing with them. Also, you need to think about the voltage levels that you need to comply with because you will have different requirements depending on the market and you need to select your TVS diodes based on that requirements, whether it's 8 kilovolt or 15 kilovolt or 25 kilovolt protection that is required by the standard is going to have different isolation requirements and different TVS voltage requirements. So that's it. And if you fully understand what we've covered today, you will never have any problem with conducted emissions again because this is literally all I can think of and I've been designing circuits for over 10 years now so everything else just simply doesn't usually come up. So please like this video and subscribe to this channel and I'm going to create more videos on those topics, maybe expand a little bit more on each of them in very near future.